What's going on, Trail Null Trainers? Welcome to another episode of the Coop Cast. As always, I'm your host, Jason Coop, and today's episode is going to be a little bit different from all the previous episodes of this podcast. Normally, I get on the mic here and I tell you great folks all about training and nutrition and physiology, and we bring on experts in those areas, and we discuss topics that are intended to provide you with a little bit of information in order to maximize your ultra running performance. But with the state of unrest that's going on in the United States right now, particularly in regards to race relations, a lot of that training advice is quite frankly, not the top of everybody's priority list, nor should it be. And so on this episode of the podcast, I brought on Joe Gray. And Joe, I could bring on as a prolific trail runner in his own right. He is one of the most successful trail runners on the face of the planet right now. Make no doubt about it. But the reason I wanted to bring Joe on the podcast is, one, he's a fantastic human being. He is African-American. And he penned this incredibly poignant piece in Trail Runner Magazine this week. And I'll link to that in the show notes. But he basically called himself out. He called himself a coward and he said, I am putting my foot down and I am going to stay silent no longer. And it, it, it really touched me because it was incredibly personal and Joe was humble enough to admit some of the mistakes that he made in the past. And so I wanted to bring Joe on the podcast to get his personal perspective on the state of the world today what he is doing personally to take a stand for race relations in this country and what he hopes the future can actually look like. Make no doubt about it, I am not an expert in this area. I grew up in a white middle-class family in suburban Dallas and although I had a lot of diversity growing up in that area, I cannot claim to have ever been racially targeted. Any of these runs that I do at super early times in the morning, nobody's ever really looked at me sideways for running around my neighborhood with a headlamp on at three in the morning or anything like that. I have no idea what it's like to be a person of color in this country, but that's not going to stop me from understanding. And I hope that doesn't stop other trail runners from understanding as well. And so I want to give Joe the floor. This is his story to tell. It's his to own. And I hope we all take a little bit of a pause out of our busy lives that we're leading day to day. And we listen to Joe and other people like Joe and try to have some empathy and perspective on how they see the world. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Joe Gray. I mean, I appreciate you coming on first, and I appreciate your honesty, particularly in light of what's going on in the in the country right now, and also in light of this um, this op ed that you wrote in Trail Runner Magazine that I think is uh, getting a lot of attention. But before we dive into that, I I want to know like what have the last several days been like for you? Um, I guess the, it's a little bit draining. Um and depressing, I guess you could say, uh, upsetting, you know, like it's, it's almost like a, it's really shocking just to see that we are still dealing with, you know, issues that, you know, I would have thought we would have been over, you know, a long time ago. So, um, I guess another word we can throw in there is just frustrated, just, you know, like, wow, we we're still dealing with this. And, and it makes me especially sad because, you know, I'm a parent now and I'm like, you know, I was hoping that, you know, my children wouldn't know what racism is, you know, they wouldn't understand it. Um, But now I feel like we're still so very much stuck under this cloud of racism that the next generation is going to very well understand it. And, and um, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people who still hold racist ideology and and promote it. And so we know that the next generation of kids will also um, hold these same views and and keep pushing that forward, um, that same agenda. And so um, yeah, it's frustrating as a parent and as an American citizen as well. So, and are you, are you frustrated 
at any particular person or any particular action, or is it just the whole weight and enormity of everything that you've experienced through your entire life that leads you to that, that emotion? I mean, yeah, it's definitely a lot of my personal experiences that I've had, you know, the, the media, um, they're focusing on it now. I think people being that we're under, you know, we're in a pandemic and people are home. We've been quarantined. People are looking at data and research and they're seeing things that they maybe never saw before. They're seeing, you know, news and watching TV and then seeing things that they never, maybe never um, thought was real or they never uh, experienced. And now they're seeing a lot of other experiences and they're seeing people that look like them um, standing in, um, in protests and, uh, for equality and, um, you know, and, and standing up against, you know, the injustices towards people of color in our country. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you say, am I mad at anything in one thing in particular, not really, I'm really mad at the system and the fact that, um, you know, I am mad at, I guess there are individual entities such as I have a big problem with Fox news. I feel like, um, you know, they're very biased for one and they're biased, like just, all the way to the other side, you know, I, I understand, you know, that they want to support their party and I get that, but sometimes what you see on the show comes off as very anti-black. And, um, so if there is, you know, one place like an individual entity, it's, it's, it's news out, outlets like that, because then people who also share those same views or maybe people who are uneducated and don't understand what they're watching will grab those same sound bites and just run with them without researching it, you know, they'll hear, there's a lot of unfounded things said on that show, or there's a lot of uh, data given skewed, you know, and, you know, we can get into that later, but, you know, for example, um, talking about um, police brutality and police deaths uh, or police killings um, against citizens and saying, oh, you know, white people have died more than black people. And it's like, well, that's not really putting it into perspective. If you're not looking at the percent in population and looking at the numbers when it comes to unarmed citizens and, you know, black versus white. And, um, you know, they avoid the real stats that really paint the picture of what's going on in our country. Um, you know, I did my uh, my thesis, for example, on uh, probation recidivism in our country. And, you know, you know, you, after I gathered all my data, you know, it was a pattern study. So I had a whole bunch of different data, databases that I had to compile my data. And, um, you know, what I ended up finding and what, you know, it's nothing new. Many others have found also there's other studies, but that, you know, when it comes to recidivism, black people are receiving stricter sentencing. And, you know, that is a big issue that you don't see on Fox News, for example, and, and people pushing that agenda that all oh, racism doesn't exist. And, there is no systematic racism. And it's like, well, we have to focus on things that really matter. And, you know, if you don't ever admit that there's a problem, it's just like, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, you, you can't go anywhere in the class unless you first admit that you have a problem. And it's like, yeah, we can't go forward because we have so many people that deny that this exists, that it's an issue. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, um, there's definitely some outlets that I have a problem with because then it creates people that you know spewing that same <laughs> the same thoughts on social media and so um and people that you don't know who maybe say it towards you and direct it towards you so you know it's it's disheartening and um, it's very anti-american to be honest i think we can all look at the current situation uh across the country right now and we can all be you know, upset and frustrated and have kind of the, and have the same emotions that you've just described. But in, unless you've actually had to experience a lot of what African Americans in this country have had to experience, it's really honestly like difficult to conceptualize. I mean, your analogy with Alcoholics Anonymous is, is I, I actually think a great one on a lot of different levels because unless you've been affected personally by substance abuse or alcoholism, it's really hard to relate to that particular disease. But as you mentioned, right. like this, this has been going on for a long time since the slave trade, right? Since the transatlantic, since the transatlantic slave trade, long, long time. Right, you've, yeah. ex you've experienced even before that even, and even before that. And you've experienced racism personally, but what I want to know is, is, what in particular about the current state of affairs for you 
has kind of flipped the switch because you've spoken out before on diversity and trail running does have a diversity problem. Let's get that, let's get out of the, that out of the way right now. You've spoken out on that before and you and I have talked about that before. You've written articles about it before, but this is a different tone. This is a much different tone. Like this is, Hey, I want to make this better. You're originally, you're like, Hey, I want to make this better. I want to make this diversity problem better. Now you're kind of like F all this. What, what, right. what, like, what is it that, that's kind of flipped that switch for you? Um, not, not that it's F all this. Like I definitely, the diversity issue is definitely something I still very much care about and project inspired diversity is definitely something, you know, once we can have normal distancing with people, it's definitely something that I plan to, to keep pushing forward with. But, um, the, uh, this, this particular last few months, what's, what's very different for us is that, you know, I think there was this aspect that we didn't realize. And by we, I'm not talking about people of color. I'm talking about the country and people around the world that technology, the lack of technology in the past for situations like uh, Emmett Till, for example, right. Um, he didn't have a cell phone to help him in a situation. And we saw the outcome of that. Um, and there's been plenty of cases that we could go, we can talk about, and I don't want to waste your time, but there's plenty of cases where technology wasn't around. So it was my word as a black person versus your word as a white person in a judicial system that is <laughs> very much biased and discriminate, uh, discriminative. So the, the last few cases that we've been seeing, you know, that have been on the media, like the Arbery situation, right? It touches home because there's a lot of black people who do go run. And we saw in that situation that, you know, some random dude could just come up to you and say, Hey, I thought you, I, I, I think you were doing something wrong, confront you and they won't immediately be arrested. And if there was no cell phone footage, they wouldn't have, they probably would still be free and they probably would have, uh, <laughs> things to say like, Oh, he did this or he did that. And that's why this happened. You know, a lie could have been made up. So black people don't feel safe now. And I think, we saw the situation with um, the Amy Cooper and Mr. Cooper in Central Park. We saw the fact that, you know, she called the police and it was almost like a whistleblower, like, hey, uh, like a dog whistle. Hey, uh, you know, this African-American man here is, is, is bothering me. And, you know, w knowing that those words would draw the police to come and, <clears throat> and approach that situation very differently than if she had just said, there's a guy here, you know, giving me a problem. So it was almost like she knew that had power. And, so these situations, right, they've been caught on tape and, um, you know, people of color all across uh, the country are like, man, um, this, this is a problem that has existed for a while. And there's been a lot of people who are probably innocent because <laughs> the only, the only reason they are serving time or the only reason they lost their lives is because there was no proof, you know, or they lost their life and, and there was no justice is because there was no proof around. And that's scary to think that, man, if I don't have a cell phone or, I, you know, if someone's not capturing what's going on with me, um, I could lose my life or I could, uh, you know, go to jail. I could be accused of something or, or, or sentenced, um, based on something I did not do. And, um, I think this time for me, it's really like, it's daunting because now I see myself as, uh, not safe in my own country. And I, I didn't realize how much of the, you know, how much that impacted our country, um, until, you know, the last few weeks, just thinking about it. So, Joe, you know, it's, yeah, it's frustrating. Joe, that last piece really saddens me a lot because you and I, we, we live in the same area. We run on the exact same trails, albeit you're running them a lot faster than I am, but we run through the same neighborhoods, the same trails and things like that. And I was mentioning to you the other day that I not once ever in my entire running history here in Colorado Springs, and I've lived here for 20 years now, and I've been a runner for over 30 years now, I, I've never not once felt unsafe about my surroundings. And that's despite me running at really weird hours of the morning behind people's houses, um, on trail, off trail, urban area, back country. I, I, I never, nothing like that has ever even crossed my mind. And I bet a lot of the people listening to this podcast 
has crossed their mind as well. Is that the reality for you at certain points that not only when you run here in Colorado Springs, but you also travel around the world running, are there, are there times where you have to do a double take and go, man, I don't know if this is the best time of day to be running or I better make sure that this situation that, that, you know, that I'm in the light that I'm running with a partner or something like that. Is that, is that the reality for you? Uh, to some extent? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, and the one advantage or pri- I'll even say it's a privilege, right. And being in Colorado Springs is that people are very aware of athletics. And, and so when they see a black person running, even at night, uh, it's not weird to them, right. They're like, Oh, he's probably just a runner, you know, uh, I hope, and I think, you know, I don't know this for a fact. I'm just assuming that that's probably how people think here, black or white. Um, but there have been times where I've been in other states where I ran at night and police have, you know, come in and stop me. You know, I'm doing laps in, in, in a town that had, um, you know, I used to work in an, in an area that was, you know, it's a nice upper class area. And I had a job there where I was working and at night and I would go running at night after, um, after I got done with work sometimes. And, there were a couple of times where I was stopped by the cops and they were like, Hey, what's going on? Ask me what I'm doing. And it's like, you know, clearly I'm in running shoes and running clothes. What do you think I'm doing? You know, <laughs> let me get back to it. You know, why are you stopping me to ask me what I'm doing? And, um, you know, I didn't think much of it back then, but now, you know, that all this stuff is coming up. I look back on some of the situations in my past and I'm like, huh, that's interesting. You do, know, um, do you remember the first time you were racially profiled while out running? Um, the first time, uh, no, I don't remember the first time. Was there, was there ever a time where like, cause you just mentioned a couple of really specific examples where you've been out running, you're stopped by the cops or somebody kind of like looks at you sideways and you just really felt unease. Right. Um, I, well, I know that definitely like, (laughs) there's been other times where you're asking like, do I do I worry about, you know, time of the day or something like that? You had asked, you were making mention of it. And, um, I made a mention in my article about being in, you know, a city where there were a lot of Confederate flags and things like that. I was in an area where I saw Confederate flags. I saw people driving with them. Um, and for sure <laughs> I, uh, was meant to run. I meant to run that night, that evening, um, when I got in and I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> not here. You know, I don't want to get, uh, hit by a car. You know, I wasn't thinking of the same situation as like, I'm on Arbery. Like I wasn't thinking someone was going to accuse me of something. I was just more so thinking, you know, people throw something at you. I've had that happen where someone threw something at me and, and called me the N word. And, you know, I figured in a, in a community like that, where there's a ton of people with Confederate flags, more than likely they probably won't like the presence of a black person, you know, just being in their neighborhood, you know, out running. So I just didn't go running and, you know, it changed, (laughs) it changed my view in terms of like racing in areas like that. Like there's some beautiful parts of our country that have some really cool races, but they're in areas where I wouldn't feel very comfortable um, eating, ordering food or anything like that. So I just don't go. Um, and it sucks cause I, I would love to go to some of these places, but, uh, um, you know, I, you know, I put my safety first and my health first and then I, I realize that's probably not a great risk to take, especially right now. You went to Oklahoma state, right? Yes. So that, that's an area of the country. I'm from Texas, right? We both know the South pretty well and I love the South. Don't get me wrong, but it, it's, it's, it's known for a lot of racism, is that anything that you oh, ever yeah. experienced while you're in college running around and just being an African American man in that area of the country? Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've told the story a little bit, you know, as of recently, I've kind of released this story and, um, and I, I'm not saying names of the people I was with, but, um, I guess I can share the story with you as well. But so we were, I was in a car with some friends and, um, you know, I'm the only, uh, you know, black person in the car. I'm in the back seat, and um, you know, my friend <laughs> is driving, and he's driving crazy. And I, you know, I keep telling him, like, "Hey, man, kill yourself on your own time. Like, slow down." You know, I'm, I'm giving him crap about <laughs> it. 
and we, you know, we had all been drinking. Um, and you know, he gets pulled over randomly and the cop pulls him out of the car. Um, and you know, he's, he's about to get arrested and the cop's trying to tell us to, to get out of the car. And I'm in the back seat uh, with a um, good white friend of mine who is, you know, uh, very outspoken and very knowledgeable about his rights and things like that. So he tells me, you know, don't get out of the car. He's like, don't listen to the cop. He's like, I know my rights. We're, you know, we are buckled up and the cop's going ballistic. And um, it was kind of <laughs> one of those moments where, you know, I speak on my, my past dealings with police and how I was raised to handle, you know, situations with the police. And so it was very uncomfortable for me. I'm looking at my friend, like, you know, he told us to get out of the car, man, I'm getting out of the car. And, uh, my friend's like, no, don't get out of the car, you know? And, you know, there was, it was at the time where we got pulled over, there weren't any people around. And, you know, I'm not sure that's why he was thinking that, like, it might not go well for us if we get out of the car. I'm not sure what his reasoning was, but he was just basically like, you know, really adamant about us not getting out of the car. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, man, let's get out of the car. I keep on trying to tell him, let's get out of the car. And finally I'm like, let me call somebody. And I'm trying to call a lawyer and ask them, you know, what are our rights in this situation? Cause you know, obviously I didn't want to get in trouble. I didn't know if I could get in trouble for, you know, being intoxicated in the back of a vehicle. Um, and so finally, you know, the cop says to me, he's, he's going off and he's like trying to open the door. Cause he sees that I pick up my phone and he's like, you know, are you trying to call your gangster thug home homeboys or something? He said, you know, something, a mixture of those words. And, you know, I'm looking at him and, you know, I, I, I initially I thought it was comical because I'm like, you know, we're dressed like we're going out on date night with our girlfriends and, and you think I'm calling <laughs> somebody to attack you. Like, I mean, what, I don't look like that. You know, I don't look like that. I don't look like I'm about that type of life. You know, I don't know where you came up with that except for the fact that I'm black and you, wanted to use the term thug and gangster and all this stuff that people used to racially profile black people, especially when it comes to movies and media. And, um, you know, finally I get out of the car and he's real aggressive with both of us. And he's kind of, uh, pushing us around and trying to put us on the car. And, you know, um, people started showing up. There were a couple of people that were around other college kids and, uh, you know, and a couple of them had heard what he said. And, you know, a couple of people from the background had, said, wow, you know, they were just kind of commenting on what he said. And I made a comment to him, you know, you know, why did you say that? Is it because I'm black? Just ask him a question basically. And, you know, he lets me go and he pretty much wants me to get out of there because I think he was embarrassed and, you know, obviously didn't want to see that go any further than it, than it did. And, um, it, it, I don't know, it, it's like an open wound getting poked because I think about this is the situation recently, right? Like, with George Floyd, it's like, if I had a cell phone to capture that, you know, it could have raised awareness of this issue. And, you know, we could have gotten the bad apples out of that area, you know, cause all police agencies aren't bad, but they got bad apples like that guy and they need to go, they need to be gone because they are not pushing the agenda of, of, of America. They're pushing agenda of white supremacy, you know what I mean? And so, um, and, and racism, you know, this is something we don't need in our country. It's an interesting story because, and I've heard you tell it before. It's an interesting story because it 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 appears to be that the cop that you're dealing with realized he was being an idiot in the middle of it and de-escalated the situation. But that is not always the case. A lot of cases right. they escalate the situation, and here's where we are right now, right? right? But it shouldn't happen in the first place. You know, I think right. that that's where we're all trying to get back to is why does this stuff happen in the first place? And you you also mentioned something during that story that I think uh, um, a lot of African-Americans are, 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 are going through and they're rehashing now. And this is the talk, right? It's the talk that parents have to have to their kids to handle right. those situations appropriately. You, you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that you have a family your father now, is, is that something that you're preparing for still in this day and age in 2020? Yeah. You know, um, and just to quickly point back to what you're saying, like how it, it usually escalates, you know, in a situation like that, if those other kids weren't around, I'm not sure what would have happened with, with the situation. I think I would have got jacked up. Right. <laughs> um, it would have been a bad situation for me, but 
yeah, back to being a parent. Um, I don't want to raise my children with the notion or even the understanding um, that they'll be racially profiled. I, I want them to just understand that you need to be respectful when the police are around. Uh, they ask you a question, you know, it, you answer it, you know, and, you know, don't incriminate yourself. Obviously, if you've done something wrong or you don't know what to do or, or to say, then just like my parents said, you know, you call mom and dad and we come here, you keep your mouth shut and you be respectful. And, um, you know, yeah, I, I'm going to raise them that way, even though some people would say, well, it's important that you should teach your kids their rights and so that they don't get violated when the cops come around. And I say to that, you know, that is sort of like white privilege. Cause honestly, like I said, if, uh, in my situation with that police officer, had I start, you know, telling him, I know my rights when I got out of that car and telling him what he's doing is wrong and, and nobody was around. I don't think that situation would have ended the same way, you know? Um, so it is a privilege and it's a privilege that I don't want my kids, uh, to think exists for them. Um, I want them to understand from a neutral perspective, be respectful to the police. You know, um, if you know your rights, keep them to yourself until somebody gets there and, or until, you know, you have a lawyer present or something like that, or, you know, mom and dad are there, or, you know, if you're an adult, understand that just know your rights, but you don't have to tell the cop that you know your rights, you know, um, make sure you got a camera, make sure something, you know, people it's being filmed you have witnesses and things like that. You know, it's, it's a new era now. I think, um, black parents are going to be raising their children differently than black parents did when I was a kid, you know, yeah. technology isn't where it is now. So they, you know, your parents couldn't be like, Hey, make sure you turn your phone on and have it recording, you know, when you get pulled over in situations just to make sure things are, are done properly and, and you're not mistreated. Well, and when your kids are teenagers and young adults, the technology is going to be another leap. So who knows what it's going to look like 10 years from now, right? Oh, man. Yeah, I, I've already, I've seen, you know, <laughs> ironically enough, I have a, I have a couple friends who have been doing protests and um, a friend of mine had like this thing in his car where it like records uh, inside his car and outside his car and it has audio. <laughs> I was like, I didn't even know you could do that right now. Yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, he, he he's bringing that to protest and um, he captured some pretty interesting stuff so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's pivot a little bit to trail running. Maybe this will be a little bit more lighthearted. Um, you know, you and I are both trail runners, and I I I I think tremendously of the trail running community. I think it's an accepting community. They welcome people with open arms. Doesn't matter your, you know, your background or your lot in life. Um, we're, we're, I, I like to think that we're a good lot of people, but I also know that I don't have your perspective and I don't have an African American's perspective. Have you ever experienced any, you know, any racism or anybody looking at you sideways in the trail running community while you're at races? Yeah, I, um, and again, I've, I've talked about it before, but I have been called the N word at a race before, you know, while I was running, obviously, but nothing I could do with, um, in the midst of the race about it or, or even ask them why they called me that. But, um, yeah, that, and then, you know, after I won the, the scent, Pike Peak Ascent, um, you know, somebody thought it was cool to drop the N word on me from their car as they're driving away, um, so yeah, I mean, I definitely, and those are just like two small examples, but it, there's been a couple, you know, and, uh, but I do agree with a lot of what you say is that, you know, trail runners to, to, to a big extent are very supportive of equality. You know, you, you do meet a lot of trail runners who like care about equality. They do like, you look at even, you know, the issue with um, the George Floyd situation, uh, a lot of trail runners stood up against what happened there and, and, and are promoting black lives matter in our country. And, and that's beautiful to see. So I do think, um, the trail running world, uh, for the most part is very inclusive and, and, and supportive. I, I would agree with that sentiment as well. Um, do you, do you find any aspects of like this new, this new position that you're taking difficult as a professional? Because I know a lot of, Sponsored athletes that are in the spotlight, they're trying to earn a living via a combination of 
their race results and their social presence, right? Their media presence and things like that. And a a lot, a lot of times that leads athletes to, to kind of walk on eggshells with very sensitive issues because they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to, they don't want to seem controversial because they feel that it's going to impact, impact their ability to obtain sponsorships and may, it may be kind of like ruffle the feathers with their, uh, with their current sponsors. Is, is that part of like, and has that been any part of your calculus in the past? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there have been a lot of times where, uh, I experienced, an issue uh with racism and i knew that i you know being sponsored by a certain brands or knowing certain people within that that had some um power over my contract that i knew their views didn't link up with mine so i knew that okay this is something I'm, i can't talk about i can't even have an opinion about it and um you know there's a lot of pressure in that sense where uh, the media does uh, influence whether or not you can talk or not, you know, uh, or, or you can have a certain opinions and, and the sponsorships, uh, a lot of times will pull out, you know, if you say something against, um, what somebody in that organization believes. And so it's, it's very stressful and it, and it's scary. It's, you know, it's risky for all of us, especially black athletes right now who, you know, we are before athletes or, or at the core, if, if athletics goes away, we are still Americans. We are still human beings. And so to have a problem with racial injustices is, is, is at the core, you know, like every human should have a problem with racial injustice because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you can't change your skin color. You can change your character. You can't change your, your skin color. So if someone has a problem with you from a racial perspective, yeah, you should speak out about that. Systematic racism is bad. It affects all of us. And if we're American, we're supposed to fight for equality because that's what our country is supposed to stand for. And so, you know, when sponsorships and things like that don't want you to, to speak out and, and, and push back on athletes having a voice against injustices, it's a huge problem, but it does exist. I feel like that now, though, it's at a little bit of a tipping point where it's kind of galvanizing a lot of the brands and a lot of the athletes and a lot of different voices to to, to speak as one, where previous, you know, you took a con- – like something not controversial because because the, the fact that Black Lives Matter shouldn't be controversial, right, at all. But for, but for whatever reason – um, it's, it's a hot button topic and a lot of athletes have kind of shied away from those in the past. And now, like I said, this thing has been, this thing has become such a, you know, such an, such an apex type of issue with the current events going on that it truly is galvanizing a lot of different voices to where nobody's afraid to speak out anymore. And I, and I, and I think that that's brilliant. I think that's beautiful that, that, that that's going on at this, at this present moment. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So what, what's your hope for the future? Like you've taken this stance, like I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be silent anymore. I'm going to say something. I'm going to make a positive impact. Have you come up with like what that blueprint, like it starts to look like for yourself? Um, in terms of like pushing diversity, or everything. Yeah. Pushing diversity, stand, you know, standing up against, uh, standing up against racism. Like it, cause it's one, it's one thing to go in and, and, I, and I'm not criticizing you at all, Joe. It's one thing to go in and have an op-ed and say, all this sucks because everybody can agree, right? Racism sucks and things right, like that. Right. It's another thing right. to take those words into action and take those actions with other people to act as an accelerant in a whole movement. Do you know, do you know what that looks like or do you have hopes for what that looks like? No, I, um, so I completely and wholeheartedly agree with you. Like there's a lot of people who just write stuff or post on social media just for clout and they actually don't intend to do anything with it. And I agree with you. Like that's, we appreciate you bringing awareness to the situation, obviously. Um, but action is what makes real change. Uh, awareness is make, what makes real change. So I do plan on, you know, you know, for me, I was just mostly speaking on to, to raise awareness and also to talk about my experiences, because I think a lot of people think 
it doesn't exist. And, and, and a lot of people who know me, like maybe I don't talk to you about this. So you don't know that I've experienced it. So it was just basically to show people that, Hey, no, this is a problem in our country It is happening. But at heart, what I truly care about is making our sport more diverse. And so, you know, project inspired diversity is something that I will continue to do. Um, that's, you know, my action. That's something that I have a, um, a passion for. Um, and I hope to expand it to, uh, to a place where, you know, I'm helping expose other people of color to the sport, young athletes to the sport and, and giving them motivation and then some drive and, and some support, um, to get into the sport because I feel like, you know, like we spoke about earlier, our sport is lacking diversity. And, you know, that's my initial issue that I came out talking about this, you know, the, the, the idea of racism, you know, within our country is, you know, a lot of it is in sport and uh, there's a lot of things that are not talked about and, and experiences of black athletes that uh, are not mentioned because uh, again, black athletes, we are afraid to speak about these things because we feel like we're not privileged enough to get sponsorships so easily in this country because we're not promoted the same way. And so we know, okay, if I bring up a social issue and my sponsors don't like it, then the chances of me getting another sponsorship are going to be really tough. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so a lot of black athletes feel pressured in that sense to where, Oh, I can't talk about this because you know, my career will be over. How can people learn so, more about project inspired diversity? Um, I mean, I guess I, I, I've written a couple posts about it, but uh, also I, um, have talked about it a, a lot of times. So, I mean, they can check my social media out. They can see um, the video that I did with Hoka about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I want to do more and, and maybe make it more informative for the, for, you know, just the public. Initially it was kind of something that I want to do to not bring attention to myself. I wanted it to be selfless and just, I want to help other young athletes. I don't, I didn't want to like push it back onto myself, but I do understand that you do need to promote things. You do need to do media with it um, because you need people to understand it. And, and um, you know, I've had a couple of people reach out and they're like, yeah, you know, you got to do this and do that to promote it more. And it's like, I get it now. I do, you know, and it, I, I just didn't want to bring it towards myself. I wanted to make it something that was just for other athletes. So I do need to, you know, create areas for people to get more information about it and, um, I've had other people reach out and offer support um, for it when I start to um, recruit more athletes for getting that out to athletes, you know, products and stuff like that. Why do you think that this uh, this lack of diversity exists in trail running in the first place? I mean, we, you know, you meant, we both mentioned earlier that the trail running community is quite open armed. You know, they're, they, they're, they're, it's a loving community. They, they, they accept everybody. It is all, it's inclusive, but yet, despite all of that, we don't see a lot of African-American or other people of color lining up at a trail race. I go to a trail race, it's a bunch of white folk, just like myself. And I, and that's, it's always kind of, it's always kind of like, it's always kind of struck me that, um, that um that that trail running has a lack of diversity but i've never been able to quite like pinpoint like either how to fix it or why is that the case in the in the first place do you have any thoughts on that yeah i think you know it, there's a there's a whole bunch of different reasons um uh, one big reason is there's a big population of the black community that don't live near you know big open spaces and trails and mountains um However, that is not a limiting factor. I think the big, big, big thing is that it's not looked at as glamorous or popular in the black community because there is no, there's no black athletes being promoted in trail running as much. Um, and so it doesn't look hot. You know, you look at basketball, you look at the, the big rise of black athletes becoming stars in the NBA. It was because you had a lot of advertisements of you know, black and white athletes. So you had a lot of top black and white athletes that had people that looked like them doing a sport that they enjoyed or, or even exposing them to a cool sport. And then they want to try it out. You know, when you look at trail running, you typically don't see the uh, black athletes in magazines or in articles. Um, you know, the outdoor sector is, is typically white, you know, that's, that's what you envision when you think of 
of uh, an advertisement is a white person when it's a trail or a mountain. And so it, it looks very different. It's very different from our culture. You know, like it's not something that we see in our culture or talk about because it's not promoted. You know, we're not in advertisements. We're not in the media for trail related, you know, projects. So I think when that changes, you will see more and more coming in, you know, more color coming into the sport. But it's both ground up and bottom down, right? The pipeline, as you right. mentioned, at the at the grassroots level is not conducive for African-Americans to get into the sport. And at the same time, there aren't a lot of African-Americans at the top that are being promoted. And so you have the problem, you kind of have the problem at both ends. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then also, you know, a lot of my focus is on, you know, the elite side of it. You know, um, there are a lot of black trail runners. Right. Um, but when you look at from a professional's perspective, I think that's where when you have like top athletes being promoted, that sparks interest in the younger athletes to try the sport when they see stars of the sport yep. that look like them. And so, you know, when you look at the collegiate system and you look at, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, black Americans who, uh, graduate college and they're good runners and, and they could do well in trails, but they're not being given the the same opportunities as other white athletes. And so you're not going to see any color or diversity when it comes to sponsorships because they're not being given the same opportunities. And you look at, you know, post-collegiate programs where um, to further your career, just in distance running in general, well, there's not very many black athletes being <laughs> accepted into those programs. And I was the one who was denied to get into one of those programs when I was better than, you know, a few of the athletes that they did accept. And, uh, you know, when we're denied, basically your career is kind of over. A lot of athletes, a big percentage of them, it's an expensive sport for one, uh, to do at a professional level. And especially if you're funding it yourself. And so when you're not given that opportunity uh, to get into some of those grassroots programs, um, the sport is done for you. And, and if it's not done, you're not going to, you're going to be a shell of your former self because you're wasting so much money to just show up to places. Like you have to work so hard outside of the sport to get money to go to places and invest in yourself. And so they're, you know, right off the back, you lose a big chunk of black Americans because they're not getting the same opportunities. Was part of that experience that you just mentioned, is, is that a little bit of why you started to steer yourself into trail running in the first place? Uh, no, no, I was, um, you know, a good friend of mine, Simon Gutierrez kind of talked me into trying out trail running. Um, so, you know, I can't say that, that, that was the reason for me. I, I just did it cause I like trails. Um, it wasn't, you know, very lucrative in the beginning just because, you know, you don't have any sponsorship support and, you know, there wasn't a ton of money and, and you, you know, I had to learn where to go to get the type of money that I wanted and, you had to kind of build a name for yourself and so that you could get the funding. And, um, and even through that um, process, you know, you learn that, okay, there, there's a difference between a black and a white athlete in terms of receiving um, funding, right? Because what looks cool in our society and, and, you know, what, what the face of, of a sport looks like is a white person. And so again, with me being, you know, the first black athlete to kind of accomplish certain things in the sport, um, a lot of that came only because I had to spend a lot of my own money to get to some of those races. And there were other athletes who were given the opportunity to get paid trips and things like that. And uh, until I made a name for myself, like over a longer uh, period of time, was I able to get those same, you know, privileges. Do you felt that, do you feel that that experience kind of like held the early part of your career back or anything? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Um, there's a lot of things that are easier to accomplish when you have support. Um, as you know, like obviously you got to have the hunger anyways to be good, but you know, there's a few more races I could have went to. There's a few um, opportunities that I could have had that could have made life a little easier for me in the, in the first part and, and, and allow me to, to train properly or um, you know, to have better nutrition or, or, um, you know, just get to the races that I needed to get to, to, to advance myself. Um, we mentioned earlier that the, the trail running community is, is very open armed and they're, they're malleable and adaptable uh, to the situation. And 
I'm heartened as well as you are to see some of the outpouring of support that, uh, that, that people have had for this issue. But for the people listening out there, which let's, let's be honest, it's, I've got a predominantly white audience. It's a trail running audience. So it's going to be a lot of white folk listen, listening yeah. to this, but they're going to want to know like, what can they do? How can they make things better? What tangible steps can they take? What do you, what do you say to that? Like, what do you tell them? What can I do tomorrow? Um, I can say from a general perspective, not just talking sport, um, to improve the outlook of our country in terms of equality. You know, I think the first step is everybody's got to like self reflect and look at, you know, question whether they have been a part of racial discrimination. Have, Have they, you know, have they taken part in that? Have they been racially biased? You know, I think it starts there is understanding that we have all been guilty of these things. Um, I I share many times with people that um, experiencing racism creates racism. You know, when you experience, like me as a black person, when I experience racism, it made me look at white people differently for, you know, like the first time you're called an N word for something or, you know, you look at white people differently because then you wonder, wow, uh, do they, you know, the next time somebody of a, a white person does anything negative to you, you start to wonder, was that done because they don't like black people? And it's because you experience racism. If no one ever said anything racist to you and they just said, Hey, you know, um, I'm not giving you this or you don't deserve this opportunity just because you don't deserve it. Then it's nothing. But then the problem is, is it, it, it like perpetuates this, this negative mentality, uh, black and white, right? There's, there's black people who've said racist things too. And, when you create this, this uh, racial awareness and you make everyone super racially aware, it creates racism. And um, so, like I said, it starts with you internally and you have to understand that you are part of the problem to some extent and you have made mistakes in your past. And then you have to question yourself, where do we go from here? And, um, you know, I think the, the biggest step is education, educate yourself on, what racial discrimination looks like in this country, the history of it, you know, don't just look at blurbs on the news or on Twitter and just take that as the gospel, you know, look at when someone says something to you, you know, look up that stat, research it, understand what that stat means. You know, Google docs has a ton of information that they just released where um, you can read books, there's videos, there's statistics that you can check out. Um, You know, so I think like education is is a big part of it because a lot of times the places that I've been where I felt like racism was an at an all all time high, you know, like like where you see uh, black people being treated really badly, really poorly, or you you have a conversation with people in that community and and the outlook is is very negative when they talk about black people and and where you know where you see white supremacists and neo nazi type groups uh circulating a lot of it is just the lack of education you know like it's easy to be ignorant if you're not smart if you if you don't do research you don't ever research anything you don't read anything and you just watch a tv channel or you just someone tells you something and you just take it as gospel then yeah, that that's ignorance, and and you will be an ignorant person. You will spew negative uh, racial biases throughout your life because you don't take the time. You're too lazy to open up a book or or look at statistics and understand the history of of racism in in our country. And and um, you know, I can't I can't say that enough. That you got to do your own research. You can't just always listen to what other people say and watch the TV and you know because every news every news station is going to be biased to some extent. Cable news is not a substitute for education. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> exactly. Joe, the, the first part of that though, actually both, both pieces of that are, are beautiful. The self, the self reflection piece, I think is an aspect that we are all going through as Americans right now. And I, I have always considered that, the hardest type of work that you can do because it's the work that you do on yourself and it require it requires insight and humility and patience, all of which are virtues that are not easy to come by. But 
if you take the time to self-reflect and dig in and figure out, hey, where have I at points in my past been part of the problem? That's a beautiful experience to start from because it's the, the kindle that lights the fire of the second step that you mentioned, which is education. And that's a woefully understood piece by many white people in our society right now. Right. Yep. I agree, man. Well, I hope everybody listening can take those two steps because it doesn't matter. Trail runner, not a trail runner, black, white, brown, Asian, doesn't matter. Like we can all go through those steps and come to a better understanding for everybody. Joe, I, I usually right. I, I usually put together an outro um, for these podcasts, but I'm not going to do that on this one. I'm going to like, I'm going to let you have the last word because this is your floor, man. This is your stage. What do you want to leave everybody with to think about during these times that we're going through right now? Um, I guess, you know, before you, um, share, a, a, a point of view that you have or, um, you know, any idea that you have socially and, and, and on public forums and also even on, um, even with your friends, right. People of color, you know, do some research first and understand when you're being insensitive. I think that's a huge problem right now, um, with, um, dealing with these racial issues is that a lot of people are saying things that are racially insensitive and they don't even understand it. So it's like, if you as a white person, do your research before stating opinions, you know, socially and publicly. And, um, it, it will make the situation better in terms of like, you won't offend somebody. And then it also will educate you to be a better person as well, to understand that, okay, that's crossing the line. Um, one example I give of this is I was having a discussion with a friend of mine who is, uh, you know, <laughs> he's, he's still my friend. He's still a good friend and I love him. And he's, he's a, you know, he's a Trump supporter and this is a, pro it's problematic for me, uh, to some extent. And we talked about this many times and, uh, you know, and he, he plays devil's advocate with me and I love him for it because I think it's necessary, right? Like it's easy to be a black person and say, uh, what about the plight of a black man and be blinded to the fact that, um, there are things that black people do to, to white people. And so we were talking about, um, the use of the word white trash. And what happened was I used the word and, you know, he's explaining to me how, you know, that could be offensive to a white person. And I hadn't thought about it, you know, and I educated myself. I said, you know, well, what does that mean? And, and honestly, it is, uh, it's one of those things like when a black person is asked, uh, can a white person use the N-word and you say no? And they're like, well, why do you call yourselves that? And it's like, well, because we're black and we understand that term and, and we're using it as a term of endearment to some extent because we took the word and changed it from what we were called and, and now we use that word uh, as, as a form of endearment in a sense. Um, and the same when I look at that word of white trash, right? I look up that word and I say, well, it doesn't quite have the same negative history as the term, as the N word. Um, but it could be offensive. And I said, you know what, I'm going to learn from that and understand that it's not okay to refer to anybody as that, even if, uh, you might feel that way. And, 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 and just to understand that, like from my perspective that, Hey, I'm humbly, I'm wrong to understand that, you know, that word should not be used to explain people, uh, white people. And, um, I think the same thing goes with, you know, like I said, right now, right. You have to self reflect and educate yourself and understand, uh, how not to be, you know, uh, disrespectful and insensitive in a time like this. You know, there's a lot of people who just go out and say, you know, the Kaepernick situation, I brought this up many times. There's people who go and say, Oh, uh, he's disrespecting the flag. He's disrespecting the anthem. And it's like, you know, you're trying to blur the lines here. And when you say that, it makes me wonder how you, you know, like I start to look at you differently. I start to wonder if you're racist because it's been said many, many times, if you just did a little bit of research, that that's not what this is about. 
he's, he's protesting, he's kneeling in a peaceful protest. Um, and when people don't acknowledge that, it's like, part of me is like, okay, maybe they don't know. They're just ignorant. They don't know. And they haven't educated themselves. But then the fact of the matter is, I don't know if you're that person or are you the person who knows why he's doing it, but you say it anyway, because you're pushing your agenda, which would be anti-black in the eyes of many black people. And it's insensitive. And so again, back to what I said, it's just, you know, I kind of went off on a tangent, but, um, <laughs> You, you got to educate yourself and make sure that, you know, you're treating each other how you want to be treated, uh, despite what color people are, treat people fairly in life. And, um, you know, I think those things are real important, especially right now, is that we're not respecting one another, um, black or white, um, white on white, black on black. You know, we don't value life like we should. And, you know, life is a gift and we should value that for our fellow human beings. And, uh, you know, it just boils down to that. Well, Joe, I, I value your take on all of this and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on. I know that it's been a whirlwind for you, uh, personally over the course of the last, uh, several days, you've done a lot of media, you've done a lot of, uh, uh, writing and I, I would imagine a lot of soul searching and I hope, I hope people out there listening do a lot of soul searching as well, because, um, this is, a turning point in our in, in our times right now and we can either turn for the better or we can turn for the worse and if we listen to people like yourself joe and and kind of learn from those experiences i think we're gonna i think we're gonna turn for the better so thank you thank you for your humility and uh thank you for your honesty and all of this and i always got your back man anytime you want to come back on the podcast and rant about anything you have the floor I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much.